Thank you. What a good day it is today. I'm glad that you're here as we are in this habit of gathering together to hear the Word of God and to be, be the church and how great it is to be able to see what's happening. And as Jeff was describing the partnership that we have, the connection that we have, that we're not alone, we're together, and that we're able to live out our life and faith with others in Christ. And so, a good day. Glad that you're here. Uh, last week was an, interesting, was an interesting presentation. My favorite line, I've quoted him all week. He didn't do it in the other services, but in this service, he said, there are, <laughs> there are more smartphones in the world than there are toilets, which means there's more crap coming into our houses than out of them. I thought that was wonderful. So I've actually put that in a perception script that will be on the air uh, before long. Uh, so I, I love that line. So uh, again, did not use that at 8 or 9.15. But, uh, uh, but anyway, this, this book, I wish you'd read this book. And even more so, I wish you'd get uh, three or four people together and you'd study it. And you could go through it together, a chapter or two chapters at a time. There's a couple of chapters in here I wish every one of you would read. And it deals with human sexuality. And he says it so well. And you really need to know what you believe and to articulate it. It's called good faith. And being a Christian when society thinks you're irrelevant and extreme. And so this sermon series really fits into this book as we're talking about what we call outsiders. We could have called it something else. We could have, you know, could have called it strangers, but we call it outsiders. We thought that had a better PR feel, but that's really what we uh, are about. So this book is available. You can pick it up right outside. There's a, a place over here in addition to the other, other places that, uh, uh, that are receiving goods and uh, gifts for Restore Hope. Um, so uh, that is available. We're in First Peter. This is where we're going to be looking. First Peter chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles, there are a few Bibles there underneath your pew, found on page 1886. And we're just going to go through the text, verses 1 through 9. And in verse 1, he begins by saying, Peter. And now, Second Peter, he says, Simon Peter. So, Peter is the author, and we know about Peter. What would you know about Peter's life? If you're conversant with the Gospels, you'll know some things about Peter. And let me put up four things I think were transformational in his life. Number one was when he met Jesus. Now, it's interesting when Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fisher of men, not fisher of fish. That was his occupation. He and his brother Andrew were out in the boat. If you look in Matthew 4, it will talk about that. But if you look in John 1, there is a different kind of a story. And that narrative is that there was something going on before Jesus said, come and follow me to the guys in the boat. Otherwise, it makes it sound like Jesus is walking along the shore, sees a couple of guys out in a fishing boat and says, follow me. They said, oh, sure, we have nothing else to do. We'll get out of the boat and follow you. That there's got to be the rest of the story. Part of that is in John chapter 1. And so you might want to look at that. But when he said, follow me, then these fishermen began to have some new tales. And that's the saying, that's the problem with mounting a fish is that the fish can no longer grow. But with Peter, he had the opportunity to have some extraordinary stories, and they often revolved around the Sea of Galilee. And in particular, you remember when they saw Jesus walking on the water, the disciples are in the boat, and, and they said, is it really Jesus? Yes, it really is Jesus. And so they said, if it's Jesus, Peter, Peter said, can I come to you? And Jesus says, come. He is the one, the disciple, that gets out of the boat and begins to walk on the water, something no one else has ever done before. 
the other disciples in the boat watch in amazement as Peter does this. Then he realizes he can't do it. He begins to sink. Jesus reaches out, catches him, and they get back in the boat. It's an interesting story uh, about following and yet not following perfectly. He did something. He got out of the boat. He raised his hand. He said, I'm on the team. I'm going to follow you, and I'll go wherever you want me to go, but I don't know what the results are going to be, and it's imperfect. And so we notice that. We see other stories. There's one after the resurrected story of Christ, and he's out on the beach, and and he is calling out to the fishermen. The disciples are in the boat. Have you caught anything? No, we, it's early in the morning. We've fished for a long time. We've not caught anything. He says, and cast your net on the right side of the boat. They do, and they catch 153 fish, which is overwhelming. Instantly, Peter knew that that guy on the beach was not just an ordinary guy. That was the resurrected Christ. And so he gets out of the boat and he goes to see Jesus. We see this again and again, the sense of follow me. He gave him a purpose, a meaning, something that his life was about. Follow me. That's the first transforming act in his life. And so with that, uh, he was following Jesus, and Jesus took him to a lot of different places, and one of the places was up north. Now, if you've been to Israel, uh, you will know where this spot is. There are actually two places called Caesarea. One is Caesarea by the sea. That's where Herod lived, but another one was called Caesarea Philippi. It's up in the northern part of Israel. And when you go there, if you go there today, there's this huge rock formation. It's like it's a mountain. And so as Jesus is talking to the disciples with this in mind, and this is where they said the Greek mythological god Pan lived and was worshipped. Pan was this half, you know, half animal, half human being and was in a panic. That's how we get the word panic from Pan, this god, and he was just, you know, hyper. So with this, as he is having this conversation, he, Jesus asked the question, there, here's this mountain right there, and he says, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, well, some say that you're Elijah, come again. Some say you're Moses, come again. Jesus said, who do you say I am? And he makes what's known as the great confession. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was like, way to go, Peter. Man, you got it. Way to go. It's like high five. And then he says to Peter, he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but it's come from my Father in heaven. And he says, your name is Simon, your name is Simon, but now it's going to be Petros, Peter. And upon this Petra, I'll build my church. Petra says the little rock, Petra is the big rock, and he's standing there, and he's pointing to the mountain, and he says, right here, you, Peter, you're the little rock, you're Petros, but the big Petra is the confession that you just made, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that's Peter, right? He blurts something out, and he hits it exactly right. Followed up by, Jesus then began in Matthew 16, begins to tell the disciples something that they do, do not want to hear. That is that he's going to suffer and he's going to die. And Peter didn't want to hear it. And he, it says, he rebuked Jesus. That's the term used. He rebuked Jesus. Jesus, in turn, rebukes Peter. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Ooh, man. This guy says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he gets hammered with, you know, get behind me, Satan. This is within the same conversation. And so we see this about Peter is that he was, he stumbled a lot. He would go first. Now, Thomas, you know, he had to have everything just right. And some of us are like that. We're perfectionists. Others, we don't mind getting out of the boat and doing the best we can with what limited information that we have, and we don't mind being, you know, shot at. We, we, we'll go that way. Others are more, are more hesitant to do that. They've got to have everything lined up in a perfectionist kind of a way. Peter was not a perfectionist. Peter, and it's kind of ironic that he was called the rock because he really wasn't. He was pretty unstable 
at times. And so he would do something great, and then he would strike out. He was a, he's a home run hitter kind of a disciple. He's not going to hit singles. He's going for the fences every time up that he swings. And so after chapter 16 in Matthew's Gospels, chapter 17, is a transfiguration, and Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a high mountain. And there they see him transfigured. And it must have been just the most incredible moment And this bright light, and Jesus is transfigured, and his whole person begins to change. And and they, you know, the disciples were just, they just didn't know what to do. They were just overcome. And so Peter decides that, well, maybe what they ought to do is build three booths, one for One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Jesus doesn't really rebuke him. It's just kind of, you can kind of hear like, (laughs) it was that sort of a thing. It just didn't connect. But bless his heart. Peter's trying. He's always coming up with something. It's not very good most of the time. And sometimes it's really bad. But he's there, and he is following Jesus. And you got to give him credit for that. Here am I, Lord. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. I'm going to sink. But I am on your team. Right? And then, at the Last Supper, Jesus said, some of you are going to deny me. Not me. Peter speaks up. Not me. Mm -hmm, Peter. Not once, not twice, but three times before, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. No, I would never do that. And of course, the third thing happens that was transforming, and that is the resurrection. And with the resurrection, we see something absolutely remarkable. Because they crucified Jesus, and Peter denies Jesus. Judas betrays Jesus. He dies. End of movement. It doesn't matter if you follow him. It doesn't matter what you call him. If he's dead, he's dead. But you know the thing is that you can remove Moses out of Judaism, and you can still be a Jew. You can remove Muhammad out of Islam, and you can still be a Muslim. But if you remove Jesus out of Christianity, the whole thing falls apart. And so if you've been reading, I hope you have in your daily readings this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the centrality of the resurrection. And it explains how it is that following Jesus because of the resurrection is the key to life. And the whole thing rises and falls on the resurrection. When Jesus was crucified, Peter's mission in life was over. The resurrection changed everything and he became a new person. He had a new hope, and he had this encounter with the resurrected Christ, which was absolutely transforming, and he began to be a proponent of that, of the gospel. And that leads us to the fourth thing that happened in his life that was transforming, and this comes from the book of Acts, and that is with the Holy Spirit coming into his life on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Now, Acts 1 through 12 is about Peter with the Jews in Jerusalem. Acts 13 through 28 is about Paul with the Gentiles in Antioch. And so this whole movement begins to shift. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, great things happen. This guy who had denied Jesus in front of a servant girl now stands up and preaches this Pentecostal sermon with with hundreds, thousands of people that come to faith in Jesus Christ. What was the difference? It was that the one who had been resurrected now gave him the power of the Holy Spirit, and he began to live that out. And Peter becomes not only the leader of the disciples, but the leader of the church. And with that, he begins to have some new things happen. Chapter 10 in the book of Acts, he, he meets a guy by the name of Cornelius, who was a devout Gentile, but was not a Jew. And so he had this vision, and so Peter comes, and the door of the church is open for the Gentiles, so that you don't have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. You become a Christian on your own. And so this is, this is a big change, and the church has to deal with that. And, and even then, as we see in Galatians 2, that Paul had to have a conference with Peter because Peter had a tendency to be 
uh, to be, he's very impressionable and other people could influence him. So he had to deal with that. But the giving of the Holy Spirit was very, very important. And so it says, the tradition is, it's not in Scripture, but tradition is that Peter, under the power of the Holy Spirit, helped the church to start, and that he went as a, a missionary, ended up in Rome, and because Jesus had said that you're not going to be able to uh, carry your hands, your arms, as you wish, the story was that Peter was crucified in Rome by Nero upside down because Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus was, flip me upside down. That's the tradition. That's not in the Scripture, but that is the way that uh, we have, uh, we've understood his demise. Something happened that changed his life. What was that? Well, it has to be right here, the resurrection. This is the life-transforming moment Because if Jesus is not resurrected, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we are wasting our time. And this is the thing that we say about good faith, is that the reason that we are strangers in this world is because others don't understand the resurrection. The resurrection is core to our faith. And we receive the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live out in this way. So this is my way of introducing you to Peter. Peter, and it says that he is an apostle, that's somebody who is sent of Jesus Christ. And then we see who he's writing to, to God's elect. And then he's got these two words. And this is how we came up with outsiders, strangers, now, we don't really like being a stranger. You know, we, would, we want to be an insider, not an outsider. But he's talking about you are strangers in the world. Paul says, don't be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the Spirit. And so it's easy to become uh, so accessible to the world that the world's spirit lives in us, and we have nothing more to offer and to live for than the world's goods. And so he says, you're, not in, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You are different. You are a stranger. You are, as a book says, a resident alien. You are a foreigner. You are a sojourner. You are a pilgrim. You are a traveler. This is not your home. This is not our home. And we should not grow too attached to the things of this earth, because this is not our home. This is only a temporary place. We have something far greater that is calling us forth. And when Christian people forget that and begin to live in accordance with the world's standards, then we've lost our identity. So there's always going to be this that's taking place in our lives, and people are going to think we're irrelevant and extreme because we're not living for the world. Our life consists of more than what we accumulate. I shop, therefore I am. That is not who we are. We're different than that. We're different than just what we can consume, what we can buy, where we can travel. Those things are great. They're, they're good things. But that's not what we are ultimately about. We're shaped by a different strategy, not by the world, but by Christ. We are in Christ. We are following Jesus. And because of that, that means that other people are not going to understand that. So they will say, oh, why in the world do you go to church? That does not make any sense to me. Why would you pray? Why would you read your Bible? Why would you give your money? Why would you volunteer? Why do you do those things? It doesn't make sense. Why is that? Because the people that say that are in the world's system. We are in a different place, and that's why sometimes we feel we are outsiders. And you're saying, what in the world is going on? Maybe the people that know this best are students in high school who feel this very extremely. And it's like, wow. And it's really hard to be a a young person trying to live out your faith in some of our secular high schools. And really difficult. And we ought to pray and we ought to support our students as much as we can. And when they go to college campuses, even much more so. 
when they're really trying to live out their faith, they need our support and our prayers. So you're going to be a stranger. That's just the way it is. And you're also, there is another word that he uses here, and that word is that you are scattered. It was really neat. I don't know, Dick, how you ran into the uh, William uh, pastor from Miramar. Uh, Dick came up and introduced him in between uh, the 8 o'clock and the 915 service. Uh, and he's here for the World Methodist Council meeting in Houston. You think about, about the people all over the world. Scattered is what happened to them. Remember I said that the book of Acts is about Peter, Jerusalem, and the Jews. But something happens that scatters them, and Paul becomes the primary person, and it's happening not in Jerusalem, but in other parts of the world, and it's not happening with the Jews, it's happening with the Gentiles. What happened? Persecution. They were scattered because of that. And so they had to get out of Jerusalem or they would die. And so they left and they went all over the world. And so this is who Peter is writing to, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout, and then he names these places, Pontus, Galatia, we would be familiar with that because of the book of Galatians, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to this, to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We don't say the Trinity here, we don't say the actual word, but note it, notice that the term is, is absent, but the concept is used. God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. In those days when you would meet somebody, you would say if they were, if they were uh, a Gentile, you would say grace to you. If they were a Jew, you would say peace to you. So he says grace and peace be yours in abundance. So he's speaking to both Gentile and Jew. And then he comes to verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, there are different ways to present the gospel. Here's one, and I can, I can thank Stephanie for this. Uh, this is a diagram that some of you evidently have seen. I'd never seen it until on Thursday, and I'm going to do my own uh, condensed version of it. This is the gospel, my friends. God became a human being. We call that Christmas. Oh, we know it's not December 25th. Okay, so get over that. You know, people say, well, there's no… Uh, okay, right, you know, okay. But just, that's not the point. It's not about Santa Claus either. We know that too. It's not about us swapping gifts with each other. We got that. But here's what it's about. God became a man. Are you kidding me? I mean, that is stunning. I don't know at what point that dawned on me. It was after I started preaching. I was like, really? So Jesus wasn't just a good guy, and God said, I'll take him. No, God became a man. And why would he go to Bethlehem in Judea and live in poverty? I don't get that. That is stunning. And when you start thinking about the incarnation, wow, this is incredible. And not only that, this is pretty incredible, too. What do you do with God who's become a man? You kill Him. And He didn't have to die. Why was He crucified? Because the Old Testament sacrificial system said, for sin to be forgiven, blood must be shed. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, became our sacrifice. And His blood, not ours was demanded, and he died on the cross. Now, if there is no resurrection, then you just got this, and it ends there, but this is what we say. Something else has happened, and that is the resurrection. He went to heaven. All kinds of other things 
took place here. The Holy Spirit was given. The church was formed. They go on mission. And the resurrection is an incredible thing. How, how do you explain the resurrection? No wonder people think we're strange. Because we believe in this and this and this, and we believe in one more thing, and we say it in the Apostles' Creed. That's why I want you to know your creed. If you don't know your creed, then you're going to have problems. You need to know your creed. You need to know what you believe. And so there's one more thing. He's coming back, and I know when. If the Chicago Cubs win the World Series, Jesus is coming back. Can I get an amen? The fly ball is going up, and just before they catch it, Jesus comes back. So uh, I guess I could say, and most of the Cubs fans will still be there, you know, but that's a different matter. (laughs) This is our story. What an incredible story. Why would anybody want to be an outsider? I'll tell you why. It's not my words. It's Peter's. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. You know the cool clothes that you buy today? Are you going to be wearing them in 10 years? They will fade. You throw them out. You won't like them. They won't fit. They'll shrink. This will never perish, fade, or spoil. Kept in heaven for you. You know where we're going? We're going to heaven. They don't understand it. So they sing these most pathetic songs. There's not, it's a beautiful song, but there's no more pathetic song I've ever heard than Imagine No Heaven. I hear that, and I was like, why would you want to imagine that? Why would you want to take my greatest joy, my greatest hope? Why would you want to take that from me? I don't want to imagine no heaven. If there is no heaven, then all of this is going to turn into hell. This is what's going to happen. who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. For you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result and praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Tony Dungy was the NFL player. He was a coach for the Tampa Bay Bucks and for the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, great man. I think he's 60 years old now. Uh, wonderful, wonderful man. Authored some books. Strong Christian. Had three sons, the oldest of whom, James, three days before Christmas, a few years ago, took his own life. They went through the service, and, you know, it's horrible, just a horrible thing. How do you deal with that? And yet, Tony Dungy spoke at the service and was able to communicate his faith in God and that all things will work together for good. And a friend came up to him later and said, Tony, we know that James was a Christian. We don't understand all of the things that have happened, but we know that he was a Christian. And we know that he's in heaven. And then he asked Tony Dungy the question. He said, with all that you know about heaven, if you had the power, would you bring James back? 
And Tony Dungy said, with all that I know about heaven, no. This is our hope. This is our hope. The salvation of our souls. And it comes not because we are any better than Peter or any worse. It comes simply because we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God Himself, who came and died, was resurrected, is coming again. He's going to give us a gift of heaven. And those of you who have lost loved ones, I want to encourage you today. They're not watching you in heaven. They're not watching this presidential election, because that would be hell. (laughs) They're not looking at us, but they've set an example. And Peter has set an example of an imperfect man who's living out his faith, who's met the resurrected Christ, who gives him the Holy Spirit, gives him hope, and gives him the gift of heaven. And this is your gift. If you want to receive it, it's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't become a Jew. You don't have to become a Methodist. It's a gift. If you want it, it's yours. You need to ask for it. And this communion service is set up for that to happen. And you'll be invited to come to the altar, and if you've never said, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I want to follow you. This is my day. It's set up. Won't you respond? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is a beautiful living picture for us of God's grace. So for us, Holy Communion is what we call